boys, welcome back. Uh, very special. I feel like I need to say Happy New Year now that summer is officially over. Um, we are kicking off the meat of campaign season with a very special guest. Many of you know him and his work quite well. Um, John Ralston. Am I supposed to call you the CEO or the publisher of the Nevada Independent? What's your um, What's your big dog name? C- CEO is fine. All right. He's the boss. Um, so, John, I'm going to care. This is what I do. I characterize our guests, the audience, and you can quibble with it. I feel like you're um, you're like the uh, Rowdy Gaines or Michael Phelps of politics. Every couple of years when the elections come around, like your face is everywhere. You understand things about Nevada, including how to say the state's name right, unlike most people listening to this. Uh, you, you see the state like no one else. You know the state like no one else. Um, so uh, here you are. You are talking to the types of people who would be waiting outside of your you know small club rock and roll shows waiting for an autograph. Welcome to Star Spangled Gamblers. Uh, that's very nice of you. Uh, although I, I am familiar with uh, Rowdy and Michael, I, I prefer my my favorite athlete of all time, Larry Bird. Really? You're a West Coast guy and you like Larry Bird? Well, remember, I'm from the East Coast. I'm from Buffalo, New York, but I, I was a... Uh, I was a huge Larry Bird fan when he was in college, and then when he came uh, to the Celtics. So I'm, I, 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 my, my college years were were dominated by debates with my roommate about who was a better player, Larry Bird or Magic Johnson. Okay, well, watch what you say because you are talking to a previously until about a week ago Los Angeles-based podcast. So um, I see you wearing a Warriors shirt. You know, maybe we can just agree to disagree in public discourse here. Uh, well, listen. Uh, I, I despise the Lakers, even <laughs> though I though I love LeBron, uh, and but I but I, I hate the Dodgers even more. So let's get going. Okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> you know, first shot's been fired. Okay. So um, for those of our audience members who don't know you and aren't familiar with your work, I was thinking I could just quiz you on some Nevada trivia to um, sort of build your credentials. Are you cool with that? Uh, I, I I don't know how good I am at Nevada trivia, but I'll try. Okay, okay, okay. Well, how do you say the state's name correctly? I think we've gotten that far. Yes, Nevada, I and mean, kudos for doing that so I don't have to correct you. Yeah, right? Come on, they should throw you in jail for that. Um, governor, I found this on Wikipedia, Governor of Nevada in 1991. Oh, now, now you're making me go back uh, in time. 1991, I'll, I'll get there. Hang on a second. Uh, that would have been, I think Bob Miller was the governor in... <sighs> Not in 91, am I right? On the money. On Good. the money. And, okay, now we're going to go for a deep poll here. Um, Washoe County, previously like the indicator county for the United States of America. If you had to guess what year do you think Washoe County was the closest to the actual presidential results, the closest to the actual returns? Oh, well, that's... You mean the, the time that it was last the closest or, or in history the closest? Last the closest. Actually, whatever you whatever you want it to be, because you're going to be right. Yeah, I, 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 I don't. I mean, Washoe, you know, it's interesting. When I first started covering politics 35 plus years ago, it was a reliably uh, red county. And it has slowly turned uh, uh, more and more swingy, as you mentioned, and, and, and is, a, is a bellwether county now. Um, actual presidential. I, I, I mean... Uh, in one Washoe, uh, but it, 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 I don't know if that's what you're referring to, but, you know, George W. Bush won Washoe. Right on. 2004. Okay. All right. All right. I, I don't actually know this stuff. I just, uh, uh, I'm trying to sound cool to you. Um, okay. Last question. Okay. Um, can you use the following three Nevada buzzwords in one sentence? Um, battle born, Harry Reid machine, Latino voters. So the Harry Reid machine was uh, able, unlike any other force in history, to harness Latino voters in the battleborn state. My man. So uh, you're writing a book about that right now, aren't you? I am writing a book about Harry Reid, and the Reid machine will be a significant uh, part of that book, yes. Well, so c- can you, can you before we start asking you prying questions about the upcoming election, I- is the Reid machine real, or is that just something, it's just one of those things that gets mentioned in the media so often, and, and we and our listeners need to have sort of a grasp of what that actually means as we look at, frankly, what appears on paper to be a pretty competitive election in Nevada. Yeah, I mean, listen, um, obviously, Harry Reid passed away uh, at the end of, of last year, and so technically, the Reid machine doesn't exist. Uh, anymore, and the Reed machine. Some people would say hasn't existed since he left office uh, in in tw- at the end of 2016. But uh, he, however you look at it, 
since Harry Reid created a political operation uh, in in the mid 2000s and then uh, got Nevada to be an early state in the presidential nominating process, uh, their their ability to register voters and then turn out those voters, especially in the two week early voting period that exists here in Nevada, has changed elections. And they they have done it phenomenally well with one only one year being an outlier, and that was 2014, when there were some miscalculations and essentially a red wave uh, uh, swept over Nevada and Republicans took everything. But every year since 2008, except for 2014, the Reed machine has been out there. Um, there is a lot in what you just said. I guess, so we always have an idea of what we're going to talk about in these interviews, but it already I can tell that we're not going to be following the script. So what well, is that? So you refer from time to time as sort of like the Clark County firewall. It, you know, I look at a map of the state of Nevada and it almost looks like Christopher Columbus's map of the sea where there's just sea monsters in these unknown regions. I mean, is that what you're saying is like, has, has there been a fundamental change in how the state works from being uh, Las Vegas you know, urban versus rural importance, you know, from its transition from sort of a red state to a blue state. Am I just babbling words here? No, Alex, I'm actually impressed with how you've studied uh, both Nevada and and my work. I, I'm, 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 I'm quite appreciative uh, of that. The Clark County Firewall, um, uh, just uh, maybe I should tell your listeners, I know they're probably very knowledgeable about this, but Clark County, where, which is where Las Vegas is in Southern Nevada, essentially is 70% of the vote. Uh, and so it, 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 it is a huge deal. Uh, Washoe County, which is which is Reno, is a little under 20 percent of the vote. And then rural Nevada, which is the 15 rural counties in between uh, Washoe and Clark, is the rest of the vote. So what the the premise that the Reed machine is operated under in Clark County, which has always had a significant Democratic lead, is to bank as many votes during early voting, that two week period before the election that I referred to, that election day, the Republicans just can't catch up. Uh, and, 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 you know, there, there is, there is sure people split tickets a little bit, but you can get a good uh, impression of what kind of lead a top of the ticket would have after early voting if 10% or 15% or 20% more Democrats have voted in Clark County. It's, there aren't enough votes left in the rest of the state to overcome that. Uh, we know some people who I think have uh, paid for new cars and houses with that that information, if only. Um, Pratik, don't let me dominate this whole conversation. I was about to start going on another tangent. You want to jump in? No, no, just keep going. Oh, okay. So, um, uh, listen, so I looked at that AARP poll that came out recently, and there were a few things that stuck out. Um, one of them was... It looked like everyone these days is talking about the Latino voter. And what is the Latino voter? Is it becoming uh, synonymous with other things? Is it drifting right or whatever? And it seemed like looking at the ARP's poll of Latino voters that they just were identical to the rest of the voters. As they got older, they got more conservative. As they got more educated, um, they got more liberal. So, I mean, is is that a voter classification in Nevada that, that bears comparison or is it do you understand what I'm saying? I'm t they, what is a Latino voter in Nevada at this point? Well, I, I do, and, and you've and, and it's a great question, but there's so many different angles to to, to what that question is referring to, Alex. And I don't want to take up all the rest of the time uh, that, that we have answered. So let, you have to let write me, another book. Yeah, exactly. Let me just let me just try to distill it and and, and use something we've already talked about. Part of what made has made the Reed machine so powerful is its alliance with the Culinary Union, which in case people don't know is the largest union in Nevada, represents 50 or 60,000 casino workers and is more than 50% Hispanic. It is essentially the Hispanic turnout machine that works in concert with the Reed machine or has in the past to turn out Hispanic voters. Um, Barack Obama won this state uh, fairly easily uh, in both elections, one one time in double digits because of the Hispanic vote that turned out Hillary Clinton got a huge percentage of the Hispanic vote. Biden, not quite as much, 
uh, and, and you're seeing and you're seeing that diminution of the Hispanic power for Democrats across the country. But uh, you you referred to to the AARP poll, which the Nevada Independent was the first to publish uh, th- this week. And and l- let me just say, and I know this sounds like a cop out, but any poll taken in late August of uh, an election year, I dismiss as not being necessarily predictive of anything. Uh, and, and there's two reasons for that. First of all, it's because it's so still relatively early. Not everyone is as nuts as everyone on this podcast right. and follows this stuff in a granular way. They actually have lives. Uh, but the other thing is traditionally, um, Hispanic the Hispanic electorate studies have shown this makes decisions very late. Uh, and so even if there has been, as you described it, I think a drift toward Republicans since 2020, uh, is that going to continue? Is it going to be affected by factors that come up? Uh, is it going to be affected by Roe versus Wade one way or another? Uh, I, I still think it's too early to tell. Um, but it's clear that the leads, leads Democrats have among Hispanics in almost every poll that I've seen are not what they once were. Do, do, do you think, I mean, I know we're here talking about Nevada, but do you think that applies nationally, everything that you just said? Um, or do you think others, you know, Nevada is unique and in that regard? You know, every state's unique. Nevada is unique. But I do think bec- that this is what people don't get about Nevada. That, that is one of my pet peeves, to be honest with you guys, which which is that Nevada is seen as this kind of weird old place. Right. It's got casinos. It's got slot machines and grocery stores. There's legalized prostitution in, 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 in some of the counties. But we are really a bellwether. We're, 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 we're a diverse Democrat, dem- demographically state, uh, very large Hispanic population, growing Asian population. And so I think the trends here are reflected, uh, are reflective of what's going on nationally, not across the board. But I don't think you can say what happens in Nevada stays in Nevada, to, con- to coin a phrase. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've heard that before. <laughs> what? So okay. So here's here's a bizarre phenomenon that's going on in the world of political prediction, aka political gambling, as you might say, in Nevada. Um, Catherine Cortez Masto, the incumbent Democratic senator, who I think, one man's opinion, has a fairly strong record as a statesman. She seems like the type of person that you know a lot of people would maybe like to see in office. It, betters really think she's in trouble. They, she is now an even odds pick to hold her seat, whereas you know John Fetterman in Pennsylvania, 75-25 favorite. Mark Kelly next door in Arizona, you know, 65-70% favorite. So what do you, like why does every everyone just dogs on CCM? Why why does the world just dog on Catherine Cortez Masto so much? Uh, I think part of it has to do with the fact that she really is, uh, um, and, and this is a description in a neutral way, not not praise necessarily, but she's much more of a workhorse than a show horse. She doesn't naturally seek publicity. She's not out there as much as, as some some of the other candidates might have been. And she, she was like that when she was a two-term attorney general. And it frustrated Democrats, by the way, because she wouldn't go out and take credit for things she should be. She's gotten a little bit better at it, but she's just not a, 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 as out there. She prefers the behind the scenes uh, kind, kind of stuff. She has a, I think you're correct in describing her kind of a solid record of achievement, but she's not a high profile senator. And, you know, the atmospherics for Democrats, as everyone knows, are not good. She's a first term senator who only won by two, two and a half points uh, when she ran in 2016. And from a distance, her opponent, Adam Laxalt, the former attorney general, uh, looks like a very formidable candidate. He's not. Ooh. He is. He he should he should be in the same category as a Dr. Oz or a Blake Masters or a Herschel Walker. He's a terrible candidate, which is why his team essentially hides him from the media unless it's a very friendly environment. And it's got to be frustrating to someone as substantive as Catherine Cortez Masto to be running against such a hollow man uh, who essentially is only competitive because of the of the of the so-called red wave atmospherics and the fact that we're a purple state, of course. Wait, so so Adam Laxalt is just the family name and whatever the national climate. I, I I don't know anything about him. Like, Pratik, have you followed him at all other than he's just what's his face, Laxalt's son or nephew or whatever? 
No, I, look, I, I'd be very interested if you could elaborate on why he's a, a poor candidate, because I guess I'm one of the betters who uh, Alex is referring to, where I think the uh, Republicans in the Senate across the board are in some trouble due to poor candidate quality. But I have been relatively optimistic about Laxalt, not because I think he's some outstanding political talent, but simply because, yes, it's a low bar, but nevertheless, I mean, he has, if nothing else, the discipline not to have a scandal every other uh, day. But uh, it sounds like I may be missing something here. Well, I guess it depends on what the definition of scandal uh, is. Uh, for, for, for the record, Adam Laxalt is the grandson of a former senator that a lot of people probably out there now don't even remember, Alex, by the name of Paul Laxalt, who was a governor and senator, was Ronald Reagan's best friend, briefly ran for president. He is the illegitimate son of uh, former Senator Pete Domenici of New Mexico, who had an affair with Laxalt's daughter, what? Michelle Laxalt. This is this is all true. Um, Laxalt didn't grow up in Nevada. He grew up back on the East Coast and moved back here to run for office uh, about 10 years ago or, or so and ran for attorney general and won in one of the biggest upsets in history uh, and then subsequently ran for governor and ran a terrible campaign and lost, then ran the Trump campaign here and was at the forefront of lying about the, the results here in a series of press conferences and, and, and lawsuits. Um, he has been perpetually trying to be in office since he arrived uh, back here. While he was attorney general, uh, he uh, went to that top gaming regulator in the state. I'm trying not to get in the weeds here, but you but you asked about why he's a bad candidate. He went to the top gaming regulator and tried to get the top gaming regulator to intervene in a civil lawsuit that would eventually cost Adam Laxalt's biggest donor, Sheldon Adelson, $75 million. He wanted he, he was clearly acting on behalf of Sheldon Adelson, not on behalf of himself. During COVID, he 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 was at a CPAC conference where there was a COVID outbreak, and he came back and tried to get special treatment to get an accelerated test. Uh, USA Today uh, broke broke that story. He has made all kinds of of intemperate statements that could hurt him, including about abortion. He was unaware apparently that there had been a referendum passed in Nevada in 1990. Uh, that, that cemented the pro-choice statute. He was asked about it during the governor's race and clearly had no idea what we're talking about. And he has called Roe versus Wade a joke, uh, which is which is obviously going to help energize any of the post-Dobbs ruling uh, 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 electorate that, that that is out there. Uh, I, I am just scratching the surface here. There's a lot more out there uh, on him. That is why they are hiding him from the media. Uh, that is why he ran away from the media, literally, by the way, uh, during the governor's race. But he's close in the polls because this is a split state, because of the way the politics is now in this country, and especially in a purple state. Well, How's that for Stemwinder? No, that, that was great. So let me, uh, let me ask you, I guess, I want to ask you the same question about both uh, Cortez Masto and Laxalt. Um, what, what is their brand in the state? I mean, obviously, we're political junkies. We dig into this. But I, so I want to ask you about Cortez Masto. Should we be will, will she be voted on primarily as an incumbent senator, a sort of referendum? Or is she also seen as being a Latino candidate? And then on Laxalt, um, do you think voters are going to view him as being a generic Republican? Or do you think when the negative ads, when the attack ads come, this, he's going to pay a tax for uh, many of the issues that you mentioned. Those are both great questions. So let me take her first. Um, she is, as you both probably know, the first and only Latina ever elected uh, to, to, to the U.S. Senate. Um, she doesn't wear that on her sleeve, but it was a big deal for a lot of people here at the time. Um, uh, there, there is some polling that shows that she has lost some ground as all Democrats have with Hispanic votes, but uh, voters, but she is very savvy about Spanish language media and, 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 and is using that. Laxalt is answering her that, uh, on, on Spanish language, uh, media as well. Um, how is she, how she is going to be seen is a key question for her, though, in the sense that Laxalt and the Republicans do not run an ad or have a quote about her without saying the Biden Cortez Masto uh, ad administration. So uh, as Biden goes, maybe she goes, or can she separate herself 
from Biden. That is that is uh, the task of a lot of these uh, Democratic senators and Senate candidates around the country. Some are doing it better than others uh, so far. I say again, we are at the beginning of September, a long way to go. Laxalt, Laxalt is really, this is what the national media doesn't get. Um, while he is a darling of conservatives in the national media and, and conservative figures in the national media, Ted Cruz has been out here for, for, for him, the governor of South Dakota has been out, been out here for him. Um, he, there was a real split in the Republican Party here about Laxalt. They don't like him. Uh, at least uh, a significant percentage don't. They, they are mad at him for losing the governorship that they think he should have won in 2018, which uh, obviously affected redistricting and reapportionment. Here, having a Democratic governor instead of a Republican governor, uh, even when the Republican Party Central Committee met. Now, we all know that may not be representative. They didn't endorse Laxalt. They endorsed his primary opponent. Uh, uh, and the Laxalt won the primary pretty handily, but so there are there there are signs of discontent. Uh, but again, I keep going back to what what I keep saying. If he can be seen as just he's not part of the Cortez Masto Biden administration, and he and he can get the base to turn out for him and enough independence, independent registration has surged in Nevada for a variety of reasons. He could win. I, I did so, see you write about that. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, Pratik. No, so actually you touched on the, the follow-up question I had, which is that I think one of the challenges I'm at least dealing with is I've been assuming that we're, we're going to see some kind of a Republican tilt, if only because of uh, where Joe Biden's poll numbers are. Now, I'm, I'm questioning that thesis because I think one of the things we're seeing across, across the country is that Democratic Senate, Senate candidates are actually doing a pretty remarkable job of distinguishing themselves from Biden or creating separate brands uh, that allow them not to be totally dragged down. Um, I guess my question is, is there any reason to think that Biden's standing in Nevada is going to be substantially different from where he is in the country writ large? Like, in other words, I mean, if his national approval rating, let's say, is at 40 percent, is there a reason to think people in Nevada will be more or less favorable to him? Or are we kind of looking at a a national bellwether in that respect? So far, the answer to that question, it's been relatively indistinguishable in the polling uh, th th that I have seen. But again, one of the biggest changes, and again, I hate to sound like uh, I'm, I'm, I'm the grizzled old veteran who started covering politics in 1986, is that one of the things that's really changed over the years, and especially with the advent of the internet and social media, is the velocity with which information moves and the velocity with which both good and bad information moves. So I really, it's not a cop out. I'm telling you uh, that as, as we are doing this at the beginning of September, so much could happen to change it that could make Biden's numbers here better or worse or better or worse nationally that I just think it's, it's, it's too early to tell. I will say this about Catherine Cortez Masto's campaign and even very smart Republican operatives agree with what I'm about to say. Her campaign so far has been almost, almost flawless. One of the best campaigns, if not the best campaign in the state. Uh, I still believe, despite all the other atmospherics and external externalities we're talking about, that campaigns and candidates do matter. That's why I still give her a slight edge in, in, in this race, despite everything else we've talked about. Well, it, Libby, if I can just briefly ask you, so there's another big name that's um, up this year, and that's Governor Steve Sisolak. Now, I don't know. I don't even know if I say his name right. He definitely looks like someone who could star opposite Robert De Niro in like a 90s, you know, crime movie or something like that. I understand there's like a modicum of scandal surrounding him that he also faces on favorables. Are, are, are you saying, Loki, that you think he might be more vulnerable than uh, Catherine Cortez Masto? Or um, do you think that's all hot air, too? Well, Joe Lombardo, who is the Clark County Sheriff, is certainly a better candidate on paper in many ways, uh, if not quite yet maybe in practice than Adam Laxalt uh, is. But I also think it's much easier to tie a U.S. senator to, to Biden than it is to tie a governor uh, to Biden, although they, they are certainly trying and trying to blame the governor for inflation and higher gas prices, which, of course, is nonsense. But people are mad. Right. And so right. You know, who is the most high profile person in the state? Uh, it's the governor. Um, I, I'm not sure what you're referring to in terms of a modicum of scandal uh, with, with, with the governor. He has a lot 
lot of issues to deal with uh, because he's governor and because he was a COVID era governor and because people right. were mad about schools being closed and and uh, and, and there was a, a COVID testing company that his administration approved that ProPublica did. Uh, did a did a big piece about that, right, right. that whose sons are connected to one of his donors, but there's been no smoking gun to show he was involved in that at all. Now again, they're running ads on that, and and, and the Lombardo campaign is going to use that uh, to try to hurt him. And it, and their first ad on it that it was a Republican governor's ad was a really brutal and, and and well done ad. And so he's worried about that being being a focus in the general election, without a doubt. Um, but I mean, it sounds like there, there you see nothing in the runes right now that uh, spells imminent doom for Steve Sisolak come November. You know, just wait and see. All of the polling shows are close um, yeah. uh, for all the reasons we've already uh, talked about. And his numbers, by the way, are not as bad as some might think they uh, they might be considering everything. COVID era governor, people mad about that purple state, all the rest of it. Uh, he is not nearly as underwater as a lot of other governors similarly situated are, which is a good sign for him. Well, why don't you bring us home? So uh, wind the clock forward and, um, you know, early voting, maybe we're five days into early voting. If you were trying to forecast the winner of any of these elections, what would you be looking for? Are there any like counties or metrics or, um, you know, like what are the things that ring the alarm bell for you that, that the election, when you know the election's over and you're ready to call it yourself? Well, I, you know, I've done it relatively early some years into early voting and, and relatively late in, in others. It, it depends on a variety of things. For instance, um, in 2014, the year I referred to when the Reed machine really didn't do its job and there was a big red wave, uh, I started uh, using a red wave hashtag after the first or second day of early voting because I could tell in Clark County the Democrats were not getting the distance they needed. We are going to probably know a fair amount early on in the first couple of days of early voting, uh, if the Democrats are really turning out their voters to create what you referred to accurately as the Clark County firewall. But this is a different year than any I've covered in all the years I've covered Nevada politics because of the surge in independent voters here. Uh, who is getting turned out? Who is what party is identifying those independents as leaning towards them or not and turning them out during early voting? I still think there's going to be trends uh, that um, uh, we can discern after a day or two, or certainly after the first week uh, of early voting. And I, I devote a lot of uh, space in a blog post uh, that, on, on our site to that uh, every cycle. And But while it's a lot of work, it's also a lot of fun. Right, right. So, so basically, um, you keep talking about a surge in independent registration, um, but we don't... It's, uh, I'm trying to say the dumbest possible thing to get the best possible answer from you. Basically, we just have no idea what that means. Like, we just see a, a new number in the column, and we haven't seen these people vote before, so we don't know what that means. A little more complicated than that. I think it's I think it's a, a, a too facile to say we don't know what it means. Yeah. I think it's hard to tell. Um, I, some the polling has showed generally a slight lean, and in these independents now in early September towards uh, the Republicans, but maybe not enough. Uh, to turn a lot to turn elections, it's it, it's hard to tell. One of the reasons for the surge is that a couple of legislative sessions ago, they passed a motor voter bill where people can register at the DMV. If they don't register with a party at the DMV, they are defaulted to independent registration. Who? How many of these people actually know they're being registered to vote? Right. Are they going to come to the polls? How, what efforts are being made to identify these voters and turn them out? But it's a huge huge number of people. Uh, the Democrats uh, and, and Republicans are both behind them now in almost every county. Got it. Got it. Got it. Um, Pratik, do you want to ask one final question and then we'll we'll uh, let John go back to his life? Yeah, sure. Um, I actually wanted to ask you, uh, th there is one more uh, Nevada question that uh, traders are uh, chewing on, which I, I know nothing about, but there's a question, uh, which state will hold the first Democratic primary for the 2024 nominee? And the markets have Nevada as being the front runner at 38 percent, followed by New Hampshire at 36 um, percent. Do you can you give maybe a just a very broad overview of what even this question is about and uh, any thoughts you have here? 
Is this entire podcast so I can make you money? Is that is that is that why you're asking these questions and keep bringing up uh, the, 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 these betting futures? I'm kidding. I'm ha- I'm happy. I'm happy to answer. So as I, I alluded to earlier, uh, Harry Reid and his team got Nevada to be an early state uh, in in starting in 2008, meaning we were one of the first four states. Uh, and and uh, but now with all the problems that have happened with Iowa. And the caucus, and Nevada was a caucus too, up until we changed the law last session, it's now a primary. There's now this debate among among the Democratic Party about which state should should be first. And Nevada has made the case, as I alluded to earlier, we're the most diverse state. Now, Iowa and New Hampshire are, are, are almost all white. We, we, we are the right state for the Democratic Party to start its contest to really test its candidates. And besides, Nevada is much more fun than either Iowa and New Hampshire. I, I think that's a, 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 a fact, not an opinion. So they should change it. The Democratic National Committee Rules and Bylaws Committee makes that decision, and then the D- DNC ratifies it. They were supposed to have made the decision, uh, I think it was this month, maybe the first week, but they postponed it now until after the election. Um, is Nevada the favorite? Who knows? It's such an inside game. If Harry Reid were still alive uh, and, and able to have the sway as the Senate Majority Leader, I think it'd be no question uh, that, that, that we would be first uh, in the nation. But now I think it's more of a crapshoot. I know the people involved in it here are cautiously optimistic, but um, uh, I'm not sure I'd bet on that one if I were you. Great, great. Well, so you're, um, as we sort of foreshadow a little bit, you're writing a book about Harry Reid. Unfortunately, my understanding is Master of the Senate is already taken. Um, Damn, I knew I'd heard that somewhere before. <laughs> so so t- t- why don't you tell our audience briefly um, about the, the book, that uh, when it's coming out, what it, uh, what it will feature about one of the more interesting personalities to, to wield power, and of course, where they can find your work um, day to day at the Nevada Independent. Yeah, let me answer the first one. First one, the Nevada Independent, which uh, is a nonprofit news site that I started uh, five and a half years ago, and we've now quadrupled our staff. It's been the best thing I've ever done in journalism, uh, and I hate to say it this way, but I've said it before. It has the least to do with me. It's the most remarkable staff. I, I just they're they're so great. These great young aggressive reporters, really wanting to do deep, fair uh, uh, journalism that matters. Um, it's a NevadaIndependent.com. Uh, I have a blog on that site. Um, but but I, I I don't do that that much anymore with all uh, of the other things I'm doing. Harry Reid uh, is the most fascinating I covered in politics for all kinds of reasons. His personal story is fascinating. His political story uh, is, is fascinating. I knew a lot about him before I started researching uh, this book. I probably know two or three times as much about him now. Uh, and so the real problem for me is what not to include in the book and make sure Simon and Schuster doesn't take a meat cleaver to it uh, when 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 I when I turn it in sometime i hope i'm knocking on wood here early next year do you think you could write a whole chapter just on his trash talk because that was my favorite thing about harry reed I, I call them uh, readisms, uh, yeah. which which trash talk is kind of uh, uh, under under that. Um, but or, or how many times his staff at the time? I used to joke when he did interviews would have their blackberries poised to send. Uh oh, what do we do about this one? <laughs> Messages to try to do damage control. But one thing about Harry Reid, and I've said this many times in columns out, he had no self editing mechanism. I mean, he would just say whatever came into his head, and and it used to drive his staff crazy. And often, you know, th- there were they were perceived as low blows, calling the president of the United States a loser, saying Mitt Romney never paid his taxes, all kinds of things uh, like that. And so it's part of who he was. And for a guy like that, who was not a good speaker, uh, was not a very polished guy, uh, to have ascended to essentially the pinnacle uh, in in the U.S. Senate, it's really quite a story. Yeah, these are always the best characters, the the McConnells, the Reeds, the Pelosi's, the Lyndon Johnson's, the just savage operators. I'm really looking forward to this book. You said it's coming out. Let me out. just say one thing, Alex, yeah. so just because you yeah. mentioned Matt for the Senate and LBJ, and I brought up LBJ. I did 24 Zoom interviews with with, with the senator before he passed uh, away. And when, whenever LBJ came up and the comparison came up, he would say, don't compare me to LBJ. There's a big difference. LBJ was a bully. I wasn't. <laughs> I wouldn't know, but I'm glad I'm talking to someone who does. <laughs> it's, tr- it's the truth, actually. What, what he was able to do to his powers of private persuasion, which nobody thought he would have if they saw him speak publicly, is really something. I, I'm parched to think of specific examples, but I, I was working on the Hill when he was at the height of his power, and he just had a way of saying these. Uh, Pelosi can do this a little bit too, like this sort of double talk where it's not it's not overtly mean, but if you know what's going on, you just can see the blood spurting from some opponent of his neck as oh, the words come out. 
Yeah, yeah, it's exactly right. And I interviewed Pelosi for the book, and they're they're very similar, and and they they loved each other uh, yeah. uh, at least politically. Yeah, well, it sounds like CCM sort of in that vein too. You know, not taking credit but doing the work. That sounds a lot like Pelosi kind of in the '90s, and you know, here she is today. So, uh, kind words you're hearing from people who worked for Republicans for years and years and years. But we love politics. We love all practitioners who are great at it. For Teak, you're smiling. I'll let you say something, and then we can let John go. I was just going to say, I mean, that my only impression for a long time of Harry Reid was as the distinguished uh, statesman, the older guy. I got a kick out of the fact that he used to be an amateur boxer. I don't know that I ever would have. Uh, thought that. But yeah. anyway, it, I'm sure there are many more gems in your book coming out. And uh, I am going to it. try to avoid as many uh, writers have not done through the decades, any pugilism metaphors in the book, because it's used so much with him. <laughs> well, do you do you want to maybe share one an anecdote? And then we'll use that as a reason to get people to buy your book? Oh, there's, you just a, there's too many. There's there, there there's two there's just too many to share and 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 I since I don't know which ones are going in the book yet and which ones aren't I probably shouldn't do that. Okay, okay, I'll make you a deal. When I, when I see your book on Shimon Schuster, when I see the book tour coming out, we'll give you a call again and uh, maybe you can maybe you can come promote it a little bit. So you said I'd love uh, to come back. You guys are fun. I'd love to do it. Yeah, we'd love to have you. So uh, uh, Nevada Independent, Nevada Independent. Don't say it wrong, King Dog. And uh, 2023, look for the book. Uh, I. I, I, I only know when I'm when I think I'm going to turn it in when they publish it is not up to me. I hope it comes out in 2023. Yes. OK. OK. All right. Well, we'll be on the lookout. John, thanks for joining us. This is going to be a thrill for our uh, users. And uh, we hope to talk to you sometime in the future. All right, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you.